blessed time last week as uh, Mike actually took a passage and discussed it with other people. We thank that for, for that. That always takes place about 11.30 so that we finish at 12. Wednesday 9.30 is the mums and toddler group. I gather there were 16 little, little ones last week and all their parents or guardians. Wednesday 7.30 we have a prayer meeting and Bible study. We're going to begin this week a series on the book of Proverbs. We shall only probably tackle a few verses of the first chapter this week. Um, that's 7.30. It will be, I think, on Zoom as well for those who perhaps can't get this far on that evening. Next Sunday, same time as this, 11 o'clock, uh, morning service has been led and preached by Simon Ward, who's with us this morning. There's one other thing just to mention, if you haven't noticed it, if you just come straight in and walk this way, um, there's some books cases in the foyer. Lots of books already in there. Many of them are good Christian books. Please have a look. If you want to borrow one, just borrow one, but bring it back when you've finished with it. Um, it would be good to see that they are used. And thank Phil for actually building it in uh, in the front there. We probably have some more. Um, if you're not quite certain what kind of book to look at, just come and ask one of us. Uh, I wouldn't suggest that you take the first book. It's a book there of theology. A mm -hmm. big, thick book. Uh, <laughs> yeah, a good book. I don't think that's probably a, a bedtime reading for most of you. Unless you've got particular interest in something, but it's there anyway. <coughs> uh, our Bible reading. I'm splitting it into two. The first one is just a few verses from Acts 11, and then after our next hymn, we'll sing. Uh, we'll, after we sing the next hymn, we'll have the uh, other Bible reading, which is from Acts 13. Now, those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen travelled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus and Antioch, telling the message only to Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the ears of the church at Jerusalem. They sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the evidence of the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul. When he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. Our next hymn, 6.34, and it asks a question, why should I fear the darkest hour? Many of these people that we're talking about today were living in a time of great persecution. And they needed to have confidence in their God. And I think this is something that we need every day. And we're going to sing this. It's got a lot of short verses 
Can you just play it through? Because I don't think we've had it for a long time. sailed from there to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues. John, John, sometimes called John Mark, was with them as their helper. They travelled through the whole island until they came to Paphos. There they met a Jewish sorcerer and false prophet named Bar-Jesus, who was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul and an intelligent man sent for Barnabas and Saul because he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, for that is what his name means, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. 
Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked straight at Elymas and said, You are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that is right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You're going to be blind and for a time you'll be unable to see the light of the sun. Immediately, mist and darkness came over him. And he groped around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. When the proconsul saw what happened, he believed, for he was amazed at the teaching about the Lord. May God bless those readings to us. Let's come now before the Lord again in prayer and petition. Dear Heavenly Father, you know that we live in a hostile world where men take up arms against each other and we see on every hand the result of sin in our world. We pray for those innocent people who have been drawn into conflict. We would pray this morning for those in Israel, Gaza, Ukraine and Russia who have lost loved ones and who long for peace and justice. We would pray for today for the success of the gospel wherever it is faithfully preached. We thank you Lord that all over the world Christian believers will be meeting to hear your word and we trust that many will come to a saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus. We also would pray today for those we know of who are ill or in hospital or who are waiting for surgery. We pray that we may all know your peace in our hearts as we seek to serve you and live for you today and through this coming year. Thank you for your provision, for your protection, and for your love toward us, which is undeserved. But your love is so undeserved, for we are simply sinful creatures. Help us today to draw near and closer to you. In Jesus' name we ask it. Seven is one I have never sung before. I simply picked it because of the words. That's what I tend to do. Um, but I knew it was a common meter one, which means that we could put it to a tune that we know. It begins with these words, Jesus, Redeemer, Saviour, Lord. There are so many different names for Jesus. I think we had a these things called an advent calendar in our house and it had 24 different names for Jesus as we went through one day right to the end uh, but here we've got four Jesus, Redeemer, Saviour, Lord the weary sinner's friend come to my help pronounce the word and bid my troubles end mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> 
to ask that a map should be put on here, which we'll refer to later. We'll keep it on um, because it's, we're talking about, ultimately, a great and first missionary journey. You may not remember, because this is a long time ago, when we started our study in the Acts of the Apostles, we mentioned there was a key verse right in the first chapter and verse 8. It read like this. Jesus speaking to his disciples. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now we've reached the point in the account of the early church when it was time for the church to reach out beyond Jerusalem, Judea and Samaria and move into the whole of the Roman world. Well, because of so much persecution in Jerusalem and Judea for the church, God's people were forced to flee from Jerusalem and moved to Antioch in Syria. That's here. Jerusalem was down here. And there was so much persecution here that many of the church people and leaders had moved to Antioch in Syria. It seems to have become almost a new centre of the church. And there was a steady radiation of missionary effort from there until by the end of the book of Acts the message of the gospel and the church had been established in Rome which was the capital of the whole world at that time. As we read through these chapters there's a momentum in Luke's story. But the momentum is the momentum of the Holy Spirit himself increasing the knowledge of the gospel as town after town heard the gospel. People after people heard the word of the Lord. This account is full of interest. Believers and unbelievers jostling each other, Jews and Gentiles eventually finding a common place together in the church. But behind it all was a dynamic power of the Holy Spirit leading the way. The church in Antioch was growing rapidly. Barnabas, as we read earlier on, was one of the leaders there. About this time he went to Tarsus. It isn't mapped on this map, but it's somewhere around about here. He went to Tarsus and found Saul, that was his hometown, and brought him to join the church at Antioch. It appears that there were a great number of people in the church there. So much so, that for the first time, the people of God, the people who had believed the message of Jesus, the people who followed Jesus, were called Christians. Before that, they'd been called followers of the way and all sorts of other names. But from now on, the people who trusted in Christ were known as Christians. It was originally, I think, almost a nickname for them. But it's by the name that we now take on ourselves, don't we? We believe that we are those followers of Jesus who can be called Christians. Christ one. We've found the Lord Jesus Christ as our Saviour. The leaders in that church, we were told there were many prophets and teachers there, and there were some of them named. You remember perhaps when we read it, Barnabas was clearly a, a major leader, Simon, a man called, called Niger, suggested that he was 
of Africa and was black skinned. A man called Lucius of Cyrene, a man called Manian, who was brought up at Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul of Tarsus. We learn a lot about Barnabas and Saul, but not so much about the others. But this was a, a leadership in the early <laughs> church. <coughs> what were they doing there? Well, we're told very carefully what they were doing. These leaders, it says, were constantly worshipping the Lord and fasting and praying. They were clearly people inspired by the Holy Spirit for the work of the Lord. And such they waited on him with fasting, worship and prayer. We don't sometimes speak an awful lot about the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is a part of the Trinity. The Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is the source of all directions for the church. And the waiting group there who were in that church were waiting to be spoken to and guided. That's the Holy Spirit's role, to guide us. A moment in the church's development would happen following prayer and fasting. We're told in Acts 13.2 that the leaders of the church, guided by the Spirit, were clearly told to set apart Barnabas and Saul for a work God was calling them to do. The words we read were, while they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit set, said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Well, they did three things at that church, the leaders. They fasted and they prayed. They then placed their hands on these two men for a specific task that they were called to do. And then they were sent off to preach the gospel, the good news, further afield than it ever yet reached. And this is where we begin the first great missionary journey. The top day you'll see it's called Paul's first missionary journey. But it wasn't just Paul, of course, it was Barnabas Paul who went down to Seleucia, which is here, it's a port, and they took a boat and sailed to Cyprus to Salamis. And they took someone else with them, <coughs> a young man called Mark, or John Mark. We've come across him before. He was the son of Mary. And it was in his house, we believe, that the Last Supper took place. We believe that he might have been one of those people that went, watched what happened in Gethsemane when Jesus was praying. He was young, keen to experience a trip abroad. Well, who wouldn't? It's almost like doing a cruise, isn't it? From Seleucia to Cyprus. Mediterranean, nice weather, most of the time. As you look at the map, you may see something that looks a bit strange. Can anyone spot what it is? What's a little bit strange about this map? The took to get to the final destination. No, not the straight line. No, it's not a straight line, no. Antioch. Who said that? Two Antiochs, yes. Um, have you noticed that? They were started here from Antioch, and ultimately they went to Antioch, and then they came back to Antioch. That sounds a bit of a strange journey, doesn't it? But there were two cities called Antioch. This Antioch was in Syria. This Antioch was in Pisidia. I don't know why they were both called the same, 
but that's where they were heading for. They were heading particularly, ultimately, for this area here, which today is in part of Turkey. <coughs> you might wonder, well, they were going out to preach the good news beyond Palestine, which was here. You might wonder, well, why did they decide to go, first of all, to Cyprus? Well, it could be something to do with Barnabas. Barnabas was a Cypriot and was probably, at this point, considered the most experienced of the three of them that were travelling. And clearly he would want the message of the gospel to go to his people. That may well be why they decided to sail, first of all, to Cyprus. And they, it wasn't a very long trip, it would only take a matter of hours, till they arrived at Salamis on this northern, or northeast part of Cyprus. When they reached Cyprus, first of all, we notice this throughout the book of Acts, the first way they tried to work and spread the gospel was to go to a Jewish synagogue. That was, you'll find that all the way through the rest of Acts, wherever these men went, wherever Paul went, the first time he went to a new place, he first of all looked for the Jewish synagogue and took the gospel to the people there. There were Jews all over the known world because they had been dispersed. And there was a synagogue in almost every small town or village. They only had to have ten adult members to build a synagogue. And so they went, first of all, to the synagogue. They worked their way then across the island of Cyprus till they came to Paphos. Now, some of you might even have been there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a very big holiday resort for people from this country. Not just because of the climate, but there's so much interest there. Um, and they have had archaeologists digging around Paphos, and they have discovered large numbers of wonderful houses that once existed there. And when they've dug down, they've uncovered some wonderful mosaics. Uh, beautiful to look at and on the floors of the, dating back to the Roman occupation. That was, they didn't go to see thing, anything like the beautiful places, but they would have been in one of those probably wonderful places because they were invited to go to speak to the proconsul, the man who had the most power he was the proconsul working for Rome, and he was in charge of the <laughs> island of Cyprus. <coughs> they probably spent something like three months or so on Cyprus, and the whole journey before they went back from when they started, when they'd been all this way here, here, down there, back in here, took two years or so. Travel wasn't as quick in those days as it is today. But anyway, they were stopping in every town or village to preach the gospel. That was what they were there for. We're told, we read it, that they met two very influential men. We need to look at these two men. Firstly, there's this proconsul called Sergius Paulus. 
is described in the book of Acts as an intelligent man. He probably had to be to be governor. Uh, and he was ruling on the island on because the Romans had placed him there. <coughs> Now news came to him that there were two visitors on the island who were preaching a message. And he wanted to know what was happening. So he sent for Paul and Barnabas. It says, wanting to hear the word of the Lord. Wouldn't it be wonderful that leaders of countries and places today wanted to hear the word of the Lord? Secondly, the other man was a sorcerer. It appears that he was, it wasn't unusual apparently for people in power to have in the retinue of people that looked after them a sorcerer and a magician. The sorcerer, we're told, his name was Bar Jesus. Well, as you probably know from pastoral defense, Bar means son of. Son of Jesus, a man called Jesus. Jesus was a common name at that time. It simply meant a man called Jesus. He was also known by a Greek name, because we are now in the part of the world where they were speaking Greek. Greek was a national tongue for most people. Jewish people spoke, spoke Aramaic and Hebrew, but most of the rest of the known world had spoken Greek. Now this man, the sorcerer, it says he opposed them, tried to turn the proconsul against them not to listen to the word of the Lord. I wonder sometimes today how many people take that role. You don't want to listen to the religious stuff. Don't do it. Stay away from it. And he was trying to persuade Sergius Paulus not to listen to them. But you see, this sorcerer, Elamas, or Bar Jesus, was of the devil. And the devil did not want an important person such as the leader of the island to turn to the Lord. The implication was that if he turned to the Lord, many other people might be influenced to do the same. So it says in our reading, Saul, and then it says, who from now on seemed to be called Paul. We never hear the word Saul again in Acts He's always called Paul from this point. It says, we're told Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit and rebuked the sorcerer. He said to this Elamas, looking straight at him in the face, rebuked him. <coughs> Listen to the strong words he said. You are a child of the devil, an enemy of everything that's right. You are full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? I wonder how many elements there are today who use everything they can to turn people away from the Lord and from the gospel. And then Paul said these words. Now, he says, the hand of the Lord is against you. This is to Elemas. You are going to be blind for a time. Not even able to see the light of the sun. Immediately, it says, mist and darkness came over him and he groped about, seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Paul rebuked this evil man with this evil spirit who was trying to prevent Sergius Paulus from accepting the good news of the gospel. I wonder if this reminds you of something we 
spoke about some years, some months ago anyway. Do you remember that Paul, who was now speaking, had experienced a similar event? He was on the way to Damascus, was blinded for three days, where God spoke to him on that road and changed his life. Saul, the persecutor, had become Paul, the preacher. And what was the result of this? Well, the proconsul, Sergius Paul, as it tells us, became a believer in Jesus. What a wonderful thought. The most important, influential person there had come to know the Lord. We also know that from history, the Cyprus was one of the earliest countries to be called a Christian country. God was at work. Wherever God's at work, so the devil is too. As we can see here. I wonder how Barnabas must have felt. A Cypriot. He must have rejoiced, mustn't he, to see so many of his countrymen turning to the Lord. But we need perhaps to think a little bit about some of the things we have been considering today. What lessons can we learn? I think whenever we look at something that happened a couple of thousand years ago, we need to see what it's got to teach us. Well, I think the first thing he's got to teach us is that the Lord wants people to go out and preach the gospel to every nation. I think in the latter of the 18th and 19th century there was a great missionary effort to send people all over the world with the message of the gospel. And this is what was happening here. Fulfilling the words of Jesus, you must be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the whole world. But how did this come about? Well, we're reminded here, I think, of the importance of prayer and fasting. Mm -hmm. We all know about prayer, don't we? We often say we should pray more, we should pray that God will bring people in, God will save people. I don't know that we do so much of the fasting. But fasting isn't just like some people do, we won't have to a meal this time, we want to keep our weight down and things like that. This was fasting deliberately to clear their minds, to spend time with the Lord, to find out what His will was. Mm -hmm. And this teaches us above all, all of us, just the same as these leaders in Antioch. They needed the guidance of God's Holy Spirit. I wonder if you've ever asked God to guide you in something. There have been times when... We had to do this. I can well remember many years ago now looking on the map to find a place called Selby. I had no idea where it was. Um, we lived some about 200 miles away from there. I'd never been there. Um, so I looked at this map. And I was going up to this place on a train to get off. I got off the train, found a place to spend the night, and went next day to a school there. And quite surprisingly to me, I was offered a particular job, which was quite a, a promotion to what I was doing. And I was offered it. And I was offered it on the balance that I would immediately accept or reject it. I couldn't even have good time to go speak to my wife. Except the thing that we have to travel and look from 
And then I start up into Selby. That's when we need guidance, isn't it? When something like this happens. Mm -hmm. Should I take this job? We don't know anybody in Yorkshire. We don't even know what Yorkshire people are like. We had three children. <laughs> we had two, the third was on the way, sorry. Yeah, we haven't quite got the third one then. Um, but we had two children that were under five and there's another one going to be born uh, before I would even start, I think, the new job, which was... It was 28th of February I came up that day. And as a school teacher, you had to give your notice if you were not going to come back after Easter by the end of February. So it was a big decision to make. It, we needed the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We needed to know, is this where you want us to go? Should I really drag my wife and children all that way from everybody that we knew? Well, I accepted it. And we said we'd have to put our house on the market if we're going to come and live up here. So we prayed. A state agent came round, looked at our house. Oh, he says, I don't think you've any chance of selling this place within at least six months. <laughs> it's big, it's rambling. Well, I think it was our daughter's third birthday, was it? It was the day after it went on the market. It was the day after it went on the market. It was his, her birthday. And uh, a state agent rang up and said, somebody who would uh, like to come and look at your house. Can you come? Well, I had to say yes, in spite of the birthday party. This, these people came. And the same day, they made an offer which wasn't far beyond what we wanted to have. It was incredible, wasn't it? You're not going to sell that for six months. That was to us a sign that God was at work. And he was wanting us to move right from where we were to where we are now. Guidance of the Holy Spirit. And I shall never forget that. Even my father and mother were very uh, concerned about doing something like this. But it was a sign, wasn't it, that the Lord was with us and we should go out and go out in faith. We need importance to guide our Holy Spirit in, by the Holy Spirit in many times in our lives. If you have a problem or a difficulty or you're not happy in your work or think you might change or move, what do you first do? You first of all take it to the Lord and ask for His guidance. I must admit, I certainly didn't want to move. Moving house is hard work. Some of you will know that. Um, but when God tells us to move, we move. There's also something else we can learn from this. Quite a vital thing. What Paul did, which was to challenge evil. I wonder if we sit comfortable around you day after day with evil things happening around us and we never say anything about it or against it. Sometimes we might. There are very brave people who will go and publicly say that this law is wrong. It shouldn't be passed. Sadly, some churches have weakened the gospel, saying, well, it doesn't matter about what the Bible says. It doesn't matter if a couple of same-sex people get married, we'll have them in the church and marry them. Challenging what is right and what is wrong. Mm -hmm. The most important thing of all, I think, 
is to come to God and ask for strength and courage. That's why we sang that second hymn. The Lord leads, and where the Lord leads, we must go. And that's exactly what Paul and Barnabas did. To go out from a place of comfort where they knew it well, and moved out all the way around there, and there's some awful things happened there. We shall find that one of the stone almost to death there. But God was with them. And if God has called you to go and do something, then you need to obey. They were obedient to the Holy Spirit. Are you? And am I? We need God's strength. We need his help. And we're going to sing 755. My God shall be my strength. <clears throat> so lovely.